Jonah got a little aggressive there. I, uh, I have the first 13 passages. If I had 18, I would probably have a coronary and just walk off stage. But uh, we are going to go through the transfiguration today. And um, by way of introduction, I want you guys to jump into a time machine with me. We're going to go way back to this time where we used to go to these things called movie theaters. You guys remember these things? right? Giant buckets of popcorn that could feed an entire village. We would have screens as big as movie theaters. You would have a sound system that just rattled your bones. It was the best, right? Now, if you got to the movies early, you would get to see the previews or the previews of coming attractions. And this was always the best sometime around March or April because you would get the previews for the summer blockbusters, those movies that were going to come out that you knew were just going to be awesome. And if you're with your spouse, you're with a friend, the preview ends and everybody does the exact same thing, right? You look at each other and you give the universal like, oh, that movie looks legit. Or you give the, that is a total dud. We're not going to see that, right? Well, our text this morning is a preview of coming attractions. Jesus is pulling back the curtain. He's revealing a little bit to Peter, James, and John. He is giving them a foretaste of what is to come. And for them, this is something that should be really, really exciting. This is something that they definitely should give the thumbs up to because he is giving them a glimpse of the glory of God that they have to look forward to. And so I'm going to unpack these 13 verses, and there's a lot in here. So I'm going to ask that you guys pray for me uh, and pray with me before we start. King Jesus, uh, this passage uh, is a lot. There is so much going on here, and it is... um, incredible as you just peel back the layers of this passage. And so, Lord, this morning, as I go to unpack this, I just pray that you would speak through me. God, that the words would be your words, that you would uh, enlighten our hearts, that you would, uh, through the Holy Spirit, illuminate the scriptures for us this morning. Lord, uh, this passage should inspire hope within our hearts. We should be able to look at this and to see what it is uh, that's coming and why that should be exciting, why that should be a blessing to us. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would move mightily this morning. We pray that, uh, Lord, not just uh, here in this space, but, Lord, we know that there are faithful churches all across the valley that are preaching your word, uh, that are making disciples, Lord, that are taking ground for the kingdom. And so we just pray your blessing over them. We pray that you would continue to move Uh, in huge, huge ways. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather together here, uh, whether in person or online, uh, to read your scriptures, to worship together, to pray, uh, to just spend this time. So Lord, go with us now, and we ask this in your son's precious name, and all your people said. All right, so like I said, there is a lot here, and one of the things about this passage is that for almost every verse, there's going to be multiple cross-references, so I'm going to be bouncing all over the place, and I just need you guys to hang with me in the midst of this. So last week, Fisher talked about Matthew 16, and he was going through verses 21 to 28, where Jesus is telling his disciples that he must suffer and die at the hands of the evil men in Jerusalem. Peter being Peter, steps up and says, Lord, may it never be. And it's never really a good idea to question Jesus when he talks. And so Jesus politely sets Peter back in his place by saying, get behind me, Satan. And he deals with that and then he moves on, but he explains to them that he says, listen, you guys need to understand this. If you're going to follow me, this is going to lead to death. I am going to Jerusalem. I am going to be crucified. If you follow me, I'm asking you to pick up your cross and follow me. The cross is an instrument of death and torture. You are going to die for my sake. You need to understand that. So losing your life in the present is going to lead to eternal life, which is the hope that he's trying to get the disciples to understand in the midst of this. And then at the end of 16, verses 27 and 28, he leaves them with this. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And this is what sets up our text for today. Verse 28. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So Jesus promises this foretaste of the kingdom. He is telling the disciples, some of you are not going to taste death until you see the glory of God coming. And they have no idea what he's talking about, but they get this promise and they begin moving with him in ministry towards Jerusalem. So six days later, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain. 
Now, in Luke's gospel account, Luke says that there's eight days, and there's not a contradiction here. It's just a way, the way that Luke phrases it is about eight days. So he's using the day that the prophecy was made, the day that it was fulfilled, and the six days in between. Matthew just counts the six days. And I'm going to read from Luke's account because this is one of the beautiful things about the harmony of the gospels is that you get multiple writers sharing the same story, and they share details about the story that you're not going to get from the other. And it's important for me to share from Luke's because there's going to be pieces of the story that I'm going to draw from both. And so reading it up front is just going to allow me to borrow from both rather than going back and forth. So in Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 36, this is the story that Luke gives of the transfiguration. Now about eight days after these sayings, took, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were very heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So Luke's account paints the picture a little bit differently. He gives us a few details that Matthew doesn't. So the first of those is that Jesus went up on the mountain to pray, right? It's not uncommon for him. You see this throughout Jesus' ministry where he goes up to a private place to pray. Now, while he's praying, what are the disciples doing? sleeping, right? That's what they do. That's a little preview of the garden for you. So Peter, James, and John take a nap, and it's not uncommon, right? Well, there's a couple things that are going on. Before we get after them for falling asleep while Jesus is going through this amazing thing, the text says that they were heavy with sleep. So this isn't like a light little nap. This is like you wake up and you have creases on your face type sleep, right? Like they are heavy with sleep. And there's a few reasons for this. One of them is Jesus, who they've been following around for the last two and a half years, just told them that he is going to die. And not only is he going to die, they are going to die. And they're not going to die easy deaths. They're not going to die fun deaths. They are going to die really miserable, painful, hard deaths. And so they're really depressed. And then they climb a mountain. And so they go up this mountain. So exhaustion plus depression equals sleep. So they sleep hard, right? And when they wake up, they wake up to see Jesus shining. His face is radiant with glory. This is the Shekinah glory, the glory of God that is shining out of his face. His clothes are being described as white as lightning. And so most people would think that when they wake up and they see this, they're like, I'm still dreaming. This is what Colin Jost calls a fever dream. One of those dreams that you have when you're sick that is so crazy that you really struggle to even understand how this is happening. And then you try and explain that dream to someone else and they're like, yeah, what medicine did you take before you went down, right? This is about where they are. They go to sleep and they are struggling to put the pieces together. Now, what's happening is the Shekinah glory, the glory of God is shining forth from Jesus. He is peeling back the veil for them to see what is going on inside. Now, the word that is used by Matthew is transfiguration. He was transfigured before them. And we get this from the Greek word metamorpho, which you guys can probably easily ascertain is metamorphosis. That's where we get our English word, this word for transformation. But the transformation is coming from the inside out, okay? So this isn't something that's happening to Jesus. This is something that's happening within him that the disciples are privy to see, which is a really important distinction for us to make. So when you think about the metamorphosis of a butterfly, when a caterpillar goes into the chrysalis, the butterfly doesn't come from outside. The butterfly comes from inside. This transformation is happening inside And then the glory of the butterfly is revealed when the chrysalis is broken. This is the same thing that Jesus is sharing, is that the glory of God has been inside him. The disciples just haven't been able to fully see it. And Peter, James, and John get the picture of that in this moment. 
Now, Jesus has told them throughout his ministry that he is the light, right? John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever walks in me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Later on, John writes in Revelation 21, 23, and the city, this is talking about the heavenly city, has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. So when we talk about the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, which Jesus is going to bring down out of heaven where we will reside one day, what it's saying is that there's no need for sun or moon or anything to light it. What we get is the glory of God keeps this place eternally lit. Not lit in the cultural sense that we have it right now, but it will be like that as well, right? It is going to be lit by the glory of God. And so this is one of the major differences is that we see that Jesus himself is not the light. He's saying that the lamb is the lamp. The lamp is the conduit through which the light shines. Jesus is revealing the glory of God that is in himself, that he is showing to people. Now, you might be asking himself, why does he show this? Why does he show, why does he reveal the glory of God to these people? So there's a few things. The first thing that you need to understand is that he needed this as a testimony. He needed the disciples to share this story after he was resurrected. He needed credible witnesses in order to share that he had told them the glory of God was revealed in him. That this story that we're going to see here in a moment with Moses and Elijah, where they talk about the forerunner of Jesus, was important to have witnesses. In uh, Deuteronomy 19.15, it says, Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses shall a charge be established. So culturally, it's important that anything that is going to be credible has to have credible witnesses. And he has three of them, Peter, James, and John. Secondly, I think that the disciples needed an encouragement. Keep in mind what I shared with you a minute ago. The disciples were just told that they were going to die brutal deaths. Peter was going to be crucified upside down. James was going to be beheaded. John was going to be dipped in burning or in boiling oil, and nothing happened to him. He didn't die, which was incredible. So they exiled him to Patmos, where he eventually died, right? All of them were going to die deaths for Jesus. And so it was important for them to understand like, hey, I know that this seems terrible, but I want to give you hope. I want you to understand that there is good coming from this. The plan that you had in mind that you thought we were going to go to Jerusalem and I was going to take over and I was going to put Rome out of power and establish this kingdom, that's not happening. That's not the way that this is going to go down. But I am going to give you something so much greater than what you're picturing was going to happen. So this is the transfiguration of Jesus. He is peeling back the veil. He is revealing the glory of God in himself so that Peter, James, and John can be witnesses to this after his resurrection. And you have to remember that they woke up to this, right? So as if this can't get weirder, their friend's face glowing, his clothes as bright as lightning, then they see two more people standing there. Keep in mind, they're on top of a mountain. Okay, people don't sneak up on you on top of a mountain. It's not as if you're in a crowd like this and someone just like walks up and you're like, oh, I didn't know you were here. They're up on top of a mountain. And not only is it two people, it's Moses and Elijah. Now, before you ask me how they knew it was Moses and Elijah, I don't know. The text doesn't tell me. Maybe they were wearing one of those, hi, my name is like Moses name tags. Maybe Jesus spoke to him by name. I don't know. The text doesn't tell me. But it's important that they understood who they were. Peter, James, and John knew that this was Moses and Elijah. So why are they significant? Why these two? Why are these the two that are here? Well, they represent important things. Moses represents the law, right? The five books that were first written, the Pentateuch, Moses is the author of these that the Jews lived their lives by. The law of God was written by Moses. And then Elijah was the prophet among prophets. He was the greatest defender of the law. You see him all throughout his ministry defending the law. When it's him against the prophets of Baal, it's 400 to 1, but he's got God on his side and he wins, right? Elijah is the man. Now he has this incredible thing where you begin to see, okay, we have the law, we have the prophets, and then we have Jesus who is the fulfillment of every prophecy that Elijah and every other prophet gave, and he is the embodiment of the law. He says himself, I did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And so this is really significant that you have the three of them standing there. And it says that they appeared in glory. Now, we don't know that 
if they're appearing in the glory that God is sharing or if they're in their glorified bodies, keep in mind that when Moses died, his body was hidden by God. If you need your mind blown, you can go to Jude 9 and read that this week. And you also have Elijah, who has the best exit in the world, right? He's taken up in a chariot of fire. He doesn't die. He gets taken up in a chariot of fire to heaven. So this is incredible that you get these three standing here talking, just having a conversation, right? And what are they talking about? Luke 9.31 says that they were speaking of Jesus' departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now guess what the Greek word that is used for departure here is? Exodus. The great lawgiver who led the exodus out of Egypt, Moses, is standing there with Elijah, who has the best exodus story that we get in history, that he gets taken up in a chariot of fire, with Jesus, who is about to accomplish on the cross at Jerusalem his exodus. Now this verbiage might sound odd to say that he was going to accomplish his departure, but understand what Jesus was accomplishing on the cross via this departure. Jesus is leading people out of sin and bondage. He is leading people from death to life. He is leading people from eternal uncertainty to an eternal hope and glory that he is demonstrating in part on this mountain. He is giving them this foretaste of the kingdom. This is where he is leading us. And this conversation is a complete affirmation of who Jesus is, that Moses and Elijah are standing there affirming that everything that Moses wrote about in the law, Jesus has obeyed. Everything that Elijah and every prophet has prophesied about Jesus, about this coming Messiah, has been fulfilled in him. The prophecies that are made are fulfilled in Jesus. And the other thing that it's affirming is it's affirming the plan that Jesus has shared with his disciples just before this. I am going to Jerusalem. I am going to die. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to be buried. But guess what? I'm going to be raised again. On the third day, I'll be raised again. I'm going to go into glory, and I'm going to come back in the Father's glory to establish the new heavens and the new earth. This is the kingdom that I'm going to be ruling and reigning in. Not the one that you guys are hoping for, but something so much better. And this is what's so good is you have this conversation happening, right? You're just imagining three incredible people talking, and then this absolutely head-scratching moment happens. Peter talks. Like, he can't help himself. He's just, he's watching this interaction, and you know he's just like, hey, you know what would be great is if I could build you guys houses right here. And you know that they're just turning, like, Peter, the adults are talking. Like, please, just... (laughs) What? And I love the way that Luke describes this because Luke, right after Peter's comment, says, not knowing what he said, right? Like, he's the friend. He just can't help himself. He had to say something. And it's easy for us to make fun of Peter in this moment, but why did he say what he said? Well, there's a couple reasons, and they're actually really significant, why he offers to build tents, right? It depends on your translation. You may see tents, you may see booths, or you may see tabernacles. Now, what was happening right now was this was the Jewish calendar month of Tishri, which is October. It's six months before the Passover. And this is one of only three celebrations that's going to take place in the Millennial Kingdom. So you have the Feast of Booths, you have the Eucharist or uh, Communion, and you have the Passover. So when Peter is coming out of this heavy sleep and he sees Jesus in glory, he's thinking, oh my goodness, he, he really might be starting the kingdom now. The millennial kingdom might be starting right now. And Moses is here and Elijah is here. That's a further affirmation to me. And I know that one of the only celebrations that's going to take place in the kingdom is this Feast of Booths. Now, the Feast of Booths, what they would do is for a week out of this month, they would erect these temporary shelters and they would live in them to remind them of the exodus from Egypt when they were for 40 years living in the wilderness. It was this way to commemorate God's deliverance from Egypt to the promised land. And so Peter's seeing all this, and he's thinking, oh my gosh, it's here. It's it's here. It's coming. We get to be witnesses to it. And he's thinking that it's the complete fulfillment of what Jesus is talking about. But there's a couple huge problems with Peter's little plan here. The first is that he is putting Moses and Elijah on equal footing with Jesus. He is saying, I'm going to build a shelter for each one of you. And Jesus is saying, you don't, you don't get it. You don't understand. We're not on equal footing. This is not what it's going to be. You're going to be residing in my house, right? 
I am going to bring this kingdom. The second thing is that once again, Peter is trying to get Jesus to bypass the cross. He's trying to get him to bypass the pain and the suffering that's going to come not just for Jesus, but he knows for him as well. And that's hugely problematic because when we look at Isaiah 53, one of the primary prophecies that Jesus fulfills is this prophecy of the suffering servant. Jesus had to come to suffer. If Jesus did not die for our sins, we would be stuck in our sins. This is a critical part to the plan of God's redemption for all people. And Peter's trying to bypass that. He's trying to take the easy way. But this is something that I want you to remember this morning. God's will and God's ways don't often align with ours. We want comfort, but he tells us to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Jason gave us that reminder last week. You can find that in Luke 9, 23. He tells us, pick up your cross daily and follow me. It's this daily suffering, this daily dying to self that Jesus is calling us to, not the easy way out. And Jesus gives us this example in his own life. He's not asking us to go anywhere that he hasn't gone himself. He tells us that if you're going to follow me, you're going to follow me by way of the cross. And there's a great example of this in Luke chapter 9. You see in verses 57 to 61, I want you guys to look at that this week, where there's three people that come to Jesus trying to follow Jesus on their own terms. And Jesus reminds them, hey, look, following me means you follow me whenever, wherever, and to whatever I call you to. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. And I'd love to unpack that for you, but I don't have time. I'm going turbo speed, and I'm sorry for that. Maybe you can watch us back at half speed later, but I have like way too much information today, and I'm really excited about all of it, in case you can't tell. So back to the text. What's happening? Peter is still speaking when this cloud descends over Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and out of the cloud, in the nicest way possible, God tells Peter, shut your mouth, right? Be quiet. This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, the first part of this phrase is identical to what we see at the baptism of Jesus. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. This is something that the Pharisees were asking for Jesus to do just a few chapters earlier, right? When I was talking about signs, they were looking for this sign, this audible voice from heaven affirming who he was in the ministry that he had. But he doesn't do it for the Pharisees. He does it right here for the three disciples. And God is telling them, listen to him. Luke even makes it an emphatic. He puts the exclamation point on it. Listen to him. And the beautiful part is, in the Greek, there's no difference between hearing and obedience. So when he says, listen, obedience is implied, which I absolutely wish was the case with my children. Can anybody resonate with that, right? I hear a few amens, right? Like, I know that my kids hear me. I can see them looking at me. I can see their beautiful blues blinking at me and being like, yes, daddy. I'm like, then why are you still sitting there, right? This is not what's happening. Jesus is telling, or God is saying out of this cloud, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. So there's a lot that's built into this one little phrase that we get from God, and I want to unpack a few of these things. So the first is that by God saying that Jesus is his son, he is affirming that Jesus is of like nature and essence with him. Now, you can read in John and uh, Romans that we are children of God, right? So you see that, but what type of children are we? We are adopted children, the reason that we are adopted into the family of God is by Christ's righteousness, not by our own goodness and not by our own essence. We are created in his image, but Jesus is of the same nature and of the same essence as God. The reason we can go into the presence of God is because of Christ's righteousness being imputed to us, which is that he gives us Christ's righteousness so that we can enter the presence of God. Now, the second thing that's happening is that God affirms that he is pleased with Jesus— he is pleased with who he is, with what he says, and what he's done. So it's an affirmation of his ministry up to this point and also of the plan that he's about to carry out in Jerusalem. Everything that Jesus was and is and said was in perfect accord with the Father's plan. 
Remember, you have Moses and Elijah standing here. He's saying that he is a complete fulfillment of what was written. He is fulfilling the law and the prophets as he said he was here to do. Now, lastly, we get one of the most important lines of the Bible. This is God's command, straight from the clouds, straight from his mouth, right? Listen to Jesus. In other words, do what he says. And this expectation of obedience is really important. Because if I'm to boil our faith down to the lowest common denominator, what we believe is this. Listen to Jesus, do what he says. And we try and overcomplicate this, but that's the heart of the message. If you go to church every week, if you read your Bible every day, if you're spending these things, what are we doing? What are we trying to do? We're trying to ascertain the will of God. What does God want for me? It's to listen to Jesus and to do what he says. And there's another critical lesson that is taught in this moment, and that's this. When we're in the presence of God, it's better to listen, not talk. This is a lesson that's reiterated throughout Scripture, but one of, the, one of my favorite passages that speaks to this is Ecclesiastes 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools which is talking, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. In the presence of God, it's better for us to listen than it is to speak. If we can go and we can sit before God and truly rest our hearts Scott and Heather shared about fasting. One of the beautiful things about fasting is that it constantly draws us to this place of reminding us we are dependent on God for everything. And when we listen, when we spend the time listening, what does God have to say to us? I'm going to give us some time to do that later, but I want to finish the text. So in the midst of this, right, God speaks out of the cloud. When he speaks, the disciples go prostrate. They are face down in the dirt. They are terrified after hearing the voice of the Almighty. And I love what happens next because God tells them, this is my son, listen to him. And the first thing that Jesus says is he goes over to the disciples and he touches them. And he says, rise and have no fear. Think if we just listen to that first command of Jesus to get up every day and have no fear. How many of y'all struggle with fear? Right? Maybe it's a fear of sickness. It's a fear of job loss. It's a fear of financial insecurity. A fear that you're not raising your children correctly. Number one fear, public speaking, right? Who's afraid of public speaking? Who's afraid of spiders, right? Our fears can run the gamut from things that are little to things that are big and philosophical and scary, but we all have fear. That's why there's 365 different reminders throughout scripture to fear not, to be not afraid, to take courage. God gives us this reminder over and over and over again. And why does he do this? Because we so often forget we get so fixated on our problems and looking at what's happening right in front of us that we lose sight of the big picture, of the hope that Jesus offers us. It reminds me of the story of three friends. They were walking after there had been a fresh snow that had fallen, and they came up to a football field, and they said, let's have a competition. Let's see who can walk the straightest line from one side to the other. And so the first friend gets his strategy. He says, okay, I'm going to go just foot in front of foot. I'm going to make my way down. And the second friend has a similar strategy. He's going to go foot over foot, but every once in a while, he's going to glance up and make sure he's online. The third friend just says, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to look at a target. I'm going to walk. And so they finish their lines, and they run up into the bleachers to look at what had happened. Now, the first friend looks, and he realizes that because he was looking down at his feet, he had no idea where he was going, and he drifted way off course. The second friend, similarly, realized that he began to drift, but every time he would peek up, he would course correct. So he had his little zigzagging line going all the way. The third friend who kept his eyes on the prize walked the straightest line of all three of them. Because he wasn't focused on what was happening at his feet, he was focused on the prize, on what was ahead of him. And we can all learn from that this morning. 
If we get so bogged down in our problems that all we're doing is looking at our feet and looking at the immediate circumstances around us, we're going to lose sight of God and his plan, of his glory, of the things that he has before us. And that's something that I really hope you resonate with here this morning, that if we spend less time talking to God about how big our problems are and instead spend that time talking to our problems about how big our God is, we'll keep our eyes on the cross and not on our problems. Now, this last part of the text is a little bit confusing because Peter, James, and John have now just experienced this incredible thing. They have seen the glory of God with their own eyes, and God has allowed them to live. And I'm sure if you were in this situation, you couldn't wait to tell the other nine disciples and everybody else around about this thing. But Jesus tells them, you don't get to tell anybody until after I'm resurrected. And the response that the disciples give probably seems a little bit weird to us. They ask about this commonly held misconception about this prophecy from Malachi about Elijah coming back before the great and terrible day of the Lord as the forerunner of the Christ. This is what Malachi says in Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Behold, I am going to send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Now, the Elijah that was prophesied by Malachi was not the reincarnation or the reappearance of Elijah who had been sent up to heaven in the chariot of fire. It was saying that he was going to have a ministry like that of Elijah. He was going to be a prophet for the Lord who was going to prepare the way. And the correlation that comes in from Luke chapter 1 is this conversation that happens between Zechariah and the angel of the Lord. Now, Zechariah is the father of John the Baptist, and when he is about to be born, the angel has this conversation with him where he tells them that he is going to come in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. And so the ministry of John the Baptist fulfills this prophecy about Malachi. What happens here is he lives his life as the forerunner for Christ. He tells everybody that you need to repent, that you need to be prepared for the coming of the Lord. And even John the Baptist gets a little bit confused that sometimes he doesn't know whether Jesus is the one. He's in prison, and he sends someone to ask Jesus, are you the one, or should we expect somebody else? And what Jesus says, he t- sends the messengers back to him, and he says, tell John what you see. The blind see, the lame are walking, the crippled are healed, the dead are raised to life. In other words, I am the one. There is no need to wait. There's no need to look for anybody else. I am the one that you have been looking for. I am the promised Messiah. I am here. And this is important because the disciples begin to put these puzzle pieces into place. Say, oh, if this prophecy has been fulfilled and Jesus is saying that he is the son of God and God just told us directly this is his son and whom he is well pleased that he is going to die. Oh, the prophecies about the suffering servant, this is who we're following. This is what's going to happen. Now, it's not that they get it completely, because remember, in the garden, Peter draws the sword on Malchus and cuts his ear off. Like, he still tries to defend Jesus to the very end, but they still begin to see this. They see the pieces falling into place. They begin to understand. It's important that Jesus gave them this foretaste of glory. He kept them encouraged by revealing a bit of himself to them in this moment. Now, I know that that was a lot to throw at you, and I went super fast, but my hope is that you tracked with me. Okay, we get this picture in the beginning of the text, the transfiguration of Jesus revealing the glory of God in himself for the disciples to see. This metamorphosis, this transformation that has happened from the inside out, that he is putting the glory of God on display for them to see, to give them hope of the coming kingdom that he tells Peter and James and John that they are going to share this after he is resurrected so that they can share the message, this truly was the Son of God. This is what he says to do. This is how the church is going to be built. This is the message they get to share. And if you read in uh, Peter's epistles, you see him talking about the glory of God. This is what he's referring to. When John talks about it, this is what he's referring to you get this picture of the glory of God, and this is why they talk about it, because they experienced it. And had they not experienced it, 
I don't think they would have gone to martyrs' deaths. It's hard for them to die for something that they didn't know was absolutely true and was coming. But they spent their lives and they gave their lives for this cause. We, on the other hand, get the privilege of the entire revealed will of God. We know the entire story. We get the beginning and the end. We're in the season right now as the church where we're leading up to what we know is going to happen. Jesus has told us he is going to restore the kingdom. I am going to bring a new heavens and a new earth where every tear will be wiped away. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more death. You will get to worship eternally in this place that is lit up by the glory of God. Go and share this message. That's what we get in the Great Commission, right? Go, therefore, and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. He gives us this commission to go out and to share this news. My hope is that you find encouragement in that. That when you see the entire story from beginning to end, you realize this is one story that we get to play a part in. It should be an encouragement to you. I also hope that you take some time this week to get into the Word and figure out what it is God is saying. I talked about this message that we get from the Lord where he is telling us to listen to my son, listening with the intent of obedience. What does Jesus tell us to do? Have no fear. Love your neighbor. Forgive people. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Deny yourself. Repent. Pray. And when you pray, listen more than you speak. I want to finish today by opening up a time of prayer. I'm not going to pray over you. I'm not going to pray for you. I'm going to hold space because it's very easy for us to think about what's next, to think about where we're going to lunch or what the work week holds or the different things that are going on in our lives. But it's very rare that we take time to just sit in the presence of God and listen. And so I'm going to open us up, and then I'm just going to hold space here for a few minutes. AJ is going to play behind me here a little bit, but I just want to allow us to take this time to listen. What is God saying to you? And during the next song, um, I'll have our ushers come and they'll pass out communion. Um, you're going to take that on your own today. We're going to have a little bit more time of worship and response. But whatever that looks like for you, I just want you to spend some time with Jesus listening. So would you guys bow your heads? Jesus, we want to listen. So often we come into your presence to offer the sacrifice of fools to give uh, our words and our worries and our cares as if you're not fully aware. Lord, we know from Psalm 139 that before a thought is on our heart, you know it completely. And so Lord, in this moment, I just want us to be still, to be still before you and to listen. Help us to hear your voice.
Jesus, I pray that as we hear from you in this moment, in this week, as we spend this time hearing from you, that you would help us to be obedient to what you tell us to do. God, that we would read your word not as a book, but as it is intended to be read. It is living, it is active, it is sharper than any two-edged sword. Help us to be obedient to your will and to your ways. We ask this in your son's precious name. Amen. So the next little bit, the ushers are going to pass out the communion elements. You just hold out your hands if you want to receive those. If you don't want to partake in communion this morning, you can just keep your head bowed and they'll pass you by. But take communion uh, on your own time here this morning. Respond in worship how the Lord is calling you to respond here uh, this morning. You can stand, you can kneel, uh, you can do however you want to respond in this time. Uh, but let's worship the Lord together. my eyes on heaven God 
this was me as the heavens roll Heartbeat. 
on their baby. And as I'm, <laughs> I'm in this weird spot between sermon prep and, and grieving with my friend, and I'm writing about the hope that Jesus gives that this place that we have is not our home. And as I was reading Revelation 21, this, this promise that God gives us in Revelation 21 of this new heavens and this new earth was such a beautiful reminder to me that this place isn't our home. So no matter what you're going through this week, no matter what sorrows, no matter what griefs you're facing, my prayer for us this week and what I want you to affirm with me this, this morning if you want to be a part of this, you can raise your hand with me this morning. But God, I just pray that you help us all to see that this is not our home, that you are pointing us towards a kingdom where your glory will fill it day and night with your presence, that you will shine forth your goodness, and we will be in a place where there is no more sickness, where there is no more death, where you will wipe away every tear we will have joy everlasting. God, that as we see brokenness this week around us, in our families, in our friendships, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our community, that we would step into that with this type of hope. That we would give the hope that only you can give, the hope of your son Jesus, to a world that so desperately needs it. So go from this place and provide that type of hope to the world. Amen and amen. Reminder, if y'all are new with us uh, any time in this past year, you want to get to know uh, about Heritage, get to know our staff, get to know what we're here, you can go to the Student Center, just walk down that hallway past the kids, uh, and you'll see the Student Center. We have donuts, we have coffee out here in the cafe area. We would love to connect with you uh, and spend some time with you, but thank you for being with us this morning. God bless.